As we know, in Nietzsche's late period, his polemic against Christianity reached a new intensity. This is most obvious in the Antichrist. Some passages in this book, however, are puzzling. For instance, the Jews are described as the strangest people in history. Since they were always sorry, since they always chose being Zion at all costs, an attitude which led to the falsification of nature. But for the uncompromising naturalist which Nietzsche claims to be, especially in the Antichrist, the distinction between being and nature which he introduces is perplexing. Either this distinction is in fact not valid, and nature is all there is, or it is a valid distinction, but then naturalism is not, not a valid doctrine. What is naturalism, roughly speaking? The idea that everything that exists can be described in terms of nature, of processes in nature, relations in nature, objects in nature, and so on and so forth. Especially, naturalism is often a doctrine presented with respect to, uh, to, to the mind to the character of the mind. <coughs> For if the distinction is valid, we must admit something Nietzsche calls being, which goes beyond nature, can be an object of our choices, and from whose vantage point nature can be falsified, as apparently the people of Israel did. Similarly, the story of Israel is presented as a primary example of the denaturalization of natural values. Initially, I'm quoting, Israel too stood in the right relation to all things, that is, in the natural relation. It was standing in the good, healthy relation to, to reality. Its God, Yahweh, was the expression of its life as a people, the expression of joy of oneself, hope in oneself. As a consequence, Yahweh was a god of justice. But eventually, this whole story unraveled, the causal relation was reversed by so-called clerical agitators, as Nietzsche calls them, nasty priests, and happiness became the reward for obeying and unhappiness the punishment for disobeying God and all the uh, relation, natural relation to nature disappeared. This replaced the natural vitalistic causality with an unnatural or anti-natural causality, in German, wieder natürliche Kausalität. Again, this is now my critical comment, it seems to me that Nietzsche's argument verges here on inconsistency. We cannot make sense of an unnatural causality, especially not on Nietzsche's purely mechanistic view of man, lacking free will and belonging entirely to nature. An unnatural causality would at the same time belong to nature and contradict nature. Okay, I hope this, I hope this objection makes sense. If you are a naturalist, your account of causality will have to be an account of relations as they happen, happen all in nature. You do not believe that there can be any causal relations other than the ones happening in nature. But that's exactly what Nietzsche seems to be assuming here in his story of the decadence of the people of Israel, who moved from a very natural, healthy position towards the world to an unnatural one. Okay. Similar considerations apply to his own criticism of Christianity. So I just discussed his criticism of uh, Judaism. Now let's look at his criticism of Christianity. Nevertheless, there is another side to the Antichrist, especially clear in sections 32 to 42 where Nietzsche develops an account of original Christianity as a childlike faith a faith of undeveloped individuals, a childness of, of a childishness withdrawn into spirituality, as it were, which knows no struggle and division, no dogmas and self-assertion, but only a continuous life, liquid, unformable, streaming from within. This is all in the Antichrist. 
So he seems to have a twofold take on Christianity. He, div he distinguishes between inner Christianity, which, about which he speaks in rather positive terms, and then external historical Christianity, of which he speaks in very negative terms. So the historical force that has come to shape uh, uh, European culture, that is very bad for him. But the inner core of Christianity, and there you will see in a second uh, quotation to this, to this end, seems to be something uh, of which at least he is uh, not dismissive. The way in which Nietzsche describes this inner faith is far from hostile. Indeed, it carries a certain gentleness towards the subject. Here you are. He's here describing Jesus' own faith and life. Jesus' own faith and, uh, faith and, and life. Such a belief does not come cross, does not scold, does not resist. It does not bring the sword. It does not even realize to what extent it could become a dividing force. It does not prove itself, either by miracles, or by reward, or promise, or even by the gospel. It is at every moment its own miracle, its own reward, its own kingdom of God. Nor does this belief formulate itself. It lives. It resists formulations, in other words, formulations into dogmas, doctrines. One could, if applying the expression liberally, call Jesus a free spirit. All that is solid means nothing to him. The word kills, the dogma, the doctrine kills. All that is solid kills. The concept, the experience of life, as he alone knows it, resists any kind of word, formula, law, belief, dogma. In the second part, Jesus only speaks of the innermost life or truth or light. Um, all these are his words for the innermost, words for, his, for the innermost. Everything else, the whole of reality, all of nature, language itself has for him but the value of a sign, a simile. He does not know culture even by hearsay. He has no need to battle against it. He does not negate it. The same with the state, the whole civil order and society, with work, with war. He never had a reason to negate the world. He never anticipated the ecclesiastic concept world, the church, clergy-like, church-like, church-based concept world. For negation is to him completely impossible. End of quote. Evidently, original Christianity is presented here as the overcoming of death, as the rejection of negation, as affirmation, as life in the emphatic sense. This has a strong affinity, I would claim, with Nietzsche's own, no less emphatic conception of affirmation, of life affirmation, described in Ecce Homo as the unreserved affirmation of suffering itself, of guilt itself, of all that is questionable and strange about existence itself." Unquote. Both Christianity and Nietzsche's ethics, therefore, offer a doctrine of salvation, a soteriology. Neither soteriology denies major realities of life, especially not pain, suffering, evil, but both overcome them by acceptance and affirmation which leads to immediate happiness on earth, not in an afterlife. So he is presenting here Christianity as an uh, imminent religion, religion of the current life, and Jesus himself as a prophet of the affirmation of imminent <coughs> life. And uh, Nietzsche dismisses here Jesus' own talk about, um, about an afterlife, and so he, he thinks this, these were not really important elements in Jesus' own ethics. So, not in the afterlife, with the kingdom of heaven as a state of the heart, not a state of your future post-mortem existence, but a state of the heart, almost like in Buddhism, you might, you might say. This affirmation amounts in both cases to the rejection of death and the attainment of a sort of bliss in the moment, a special moment, 
namely the moment in which the present, the particular, coincides with the ideal, the infinite. In Christianity's case, this is God, heaven, eternity. Sin, any relation distancing God uh, from man, is removed. This is precisely the good news, Nietzsche writes. Bliss is not promised or subject to conditions. It is the only reality. I've just quoted from Nietzsche. The same coincidence of particular and ideal is found in Nietzsche's own ethics as well. As a fragment from 1886 puts it, I quote, if we say yes to even one moment, we have not only said yes to ourselves, but to all existence. So we have to say yes. If we say yes to one moment, we say yes to all eternity. I'll come back to this, to this passage. It's uh, longer than, than, um, than this. <coughs> In both cases, then, the doctrine of salvation is not based on a body of doctrines, on conditions, but on something more immediate, something instinctual. In Christianity's case, this is simply the uncompromising realization of the ethics of universal love. Jesus, this great symbolist, as Nietzsche calls him, lived and died as he preached, exactly as he preached. In Nietzsche's case, the practice of salvation is less clear, I would argue, but may well be something more contemplative, a poetical or ecstatic state attained after reaching the affirmative yes state. So I'm saying that um, uh, Christianity in some sense is the better buy because you read the Bible and you, you kind of get the idea of how salvation is possible. It's less clear in Nietzsche, I would, I would, I would uh, claim. How are we then to reconcile this, uh, the seemingly conflicting things Nietzsche says about Christianity? On the one hand, calling it the blemish of mankind, right? Uh, utter disaster to, to man, uh, for mankind. On the other hand, look what he has said about St. Paul, what he says about uh, um, Jesus, and so on. In order to, to solve this um, problem, we need to look at a few... German philosophers of the 20th century, which I think have given very, very important arguments. This is not, this is, they are not very well known in the Anglophone literature on Nietzsche. So what I'm telling you here uh, is pretty much groundbreaking stuff. However, I don't have enough time to discuss all of them. So uh, some of these philosophers include uh, Heidegger, Jaspers. I couldn't find quickly a photo of Simmel, so there is no Georg Simmel here. And then, of course, especially Franz Overbeck again, Nietzsche's um, uh, lifelong friend. <clears throat> Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, gives us a first clue as to how we can reconcile Nietzsche's seeming contradictory remarks about Christianity. Heidegger writes, Nietzsche does not understand Christianity as the Christian life which once and for all <coughs> Sorry, which once and for a short life existed prior to the composition of the gospel and the missionary propaganda of St. Paul. For Nietzsche, Christianity is the historical, secular, political phenomenon of the church and its claim to power within the formation of Western humanity and its modern culture. Christianity in this sense and the Christian life of the New Testament faith are not the same. <coughs> A Christian life is not necessarily in need of Christianity. Therefore, a confrontation with Christianity is by no means an absolute battle against what is Christian. So this was just um, a clue offered by Heidegger. The distinction made here between original Christian life and Christianity as a historical phenomenon allows for the possibility that one may criticize Christianity while being informed by a Christian life and its value, and I would argue that's exactly Nietzsche's own predicament. I will now skip my discussion of Karl Jaspers and Georg Simmel's take on Nietzsche on Christianity. We simply do not have the time, and uh, jump to the end of my lecture, where I am uh, probing an even more radical idea, right? I'm not just saying that Nietzsche was in his criticism of Christianity as a historical phenomenon informed by the inner ethics of, 
of uh, Christianity. Rather, I'm, I'm claiming that, in fact, his own value system is transcendent and therefore much more religious than, um, than it appears at first sight. Franz Overbeck, Nietzsche's friend, argued that key aspects of Nietzsche's ethics, especially the ideas of Zarathustra, the idea of the Superman, the distinction between slave and morality, so, sorry, slave and master morality, and the eternal recurrence are all mythological constructs, not from this world, as Overbeck wrote, figments of fantasy and dreams, mysteries. The slave-master distinction, for instance, is based, according to Overbeck, on a most forced historical construction, an empty phantasm reminiscent of the idealisms of the German philosophers Nietzsche otherwise himself combated. As an empirical law, the eternal recurrence, Overbeck argued, has no evidence in human history and clashes in fact with Nietzsche's metaphysics of power, which implies the opposite, perpetual change. We can add here to Overbeck's argument, in fact, criticism of his friend Nietzsche, two more thoughts. First, there cannot be even any possible evidence for an eternal recurrence, since any piece of evidence in any cycle is merely evidence for something within the cycle. So he famously propounded this doctrine of the eternal recurrence of the same, and uh, people have been debating what exactly he meant by that. Is that supposed to be just a psychological attitude I take towards my own life, that I live every moment in such a way as if it will be recurring in all eternity, again and again and again, in a cycle that's supposed to somehow um, yeah, undermine my, my need for a transcendent world, for salvation. Or is it rather that this is... Uh, this is, this is meant literally as, as, a, as a proposal as to how the world works, how the universe works, that it eternally recurs again. If it's the second one, I am saying it's wrong, right? We cannot really make sense for it, given that Nietzsche is a naturalist, and that means he's an empiricist. For him, all knowledge has to be um, acquired by experience. You cannot have any experiential evidence for the eternal recurrence because every putative evidence that the world will be recurring again and again will be only evidence within the current cycle of the world and nothing and will not be pointing at anything outside of that cycle. So that's my first objection. Second, if the new ethics and life Nietzsche proposes are based on the insight of the eternal recurrence, then the very insight of the recurrence is also eternally recurring. But then there is nothing new in my insight into the eternal recurrence. It too has occurred before and will occur again. Why should this mark a tremendous moment, as Nietzsche puts it, of empowering and changing me? It might, quite to the contrary, have a debilitating effect on me, because I realized that even this moment has come before. This suggests that the eternal recurrence is either a phantasm, a fictional construct, construct, or at best a mere regulative ideal or postulate, like Immanuel Kant's postulates, but then why not accept Immanuel Kant's ethical postulates? <clears throat> there are other phantasmagoric aspects of Nietzsche's ethics. In Dawn, Nietzsche takes issue with the inference life could not be bearable if there were no God. Hence, there must be a God or an ethical importance to life. So that's supposed to be a proof or sort of ethical proof of the existence of God. There must be a, there must be a God otherwise... Uh, I, we would end up in despair. Something like that is found in Kant. So, and Nietzsche rejects this uh, putative proof of the existence of God. He thinks that it is presumptuous to assume that there is any necessity for my own preservation. So hence, it's ridiculous to believe that God must exist so that my existence gets preserved. But I believe that Nietzsche gets things very wrong here. 
In many cases, this so-called inference, this so-called proof for the existence of God, is just another expression of hope and desperation, not in the sense of, hence God necessarily exists, rather in the sense of, let there be a God, hopefully there is a God. As such, this is an expression of the subjective desire to live that we humans have. And since this is the only desire of this kind, there is no life external perspective could, to condemn such putative inferences or proofs for the existence of God. And for this reason, religion will always exist, will never die. Nietzsche is proving here to be surprisingly unperceptive or maybe dismissive of certain phenomena of life in the name of an idealized life external standard of objectivity, so external indeed that it can be seen as a sort of transcendent focus, an imaginary focus, focus imaginarius, I'm using a phrase from Kant. So an imaginary focus of faith which he Nietzsche so readily dismissed in Christianity and other religions. If Nietzsche rejects Christianity because it makes salvation conditional of cert on certain future beliefs, on transcendent beliefs, which imply the negation of life as we currently know it, then it is no less true for his own ethics. Both propound, both uh, Christianity and Nietzsche's ethics propound an ideal unreachable to humans as they are in their finitude, a, a transcendent value system which, if realized, would involve a radical change in our nature, a transfiguration of us human beings. Yeah? He's, in other words, there cannot be any properly immanent ethics. We are <laughs> desperate creatures always looking in one way or, or another for some sort of uh, uh, transcendence. Even when people come along and claim that, no, 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 they are just believing in an imminent ethics. If you look very carefully at their ideals, you will see that they are not ideals which can be fully realized uh, in this existence. All this may, may make it look as if Nietzsche is merely incapable to escape the transcendent elements which he combats in other systems of ethics. In fact, something more radical can be claimed. Nietzsche himself seeks transcendence and his ethics is an expression of this aim. Two representative passages may serve to demonstrate this. So this is now the punchline of my lecture. The first was already mentioned, the 1886 fragment, which now I will read out in full. If we say yes to even one moment, we have not only said yes to ourselves, but to all existence. For nothing stands only for itself, neither in ourselves nor in anything. And if our soul has even once, like a string, trembled and resounded with happiness, then all eternities were needed to lead to this single event. And in this single moment of saying yes, all eternity was accepted, redeemed, justified and affirmed. Amazing passage. Is the pathos of this passage, this incantation of salvation in the moment, substantially that different from the religious pathos of religious thinkers? Plotinus, for instance, the young Luther, or Meister Eckhart, a medieval mystic? Is it less diaphanous, diffuse, frenetic, ecstatic, mystical, irrational, than the most devout writings of the religious tradition? Is it less fideistic? Assuming we say yes to a single moment, why would it follow from that that we have embraced all being, all eternities, beyond that very moment? What exactly is this yes saying Nietzsche is talking about? It is seemingly saddled with an enormous weight unlike any ordinary speech act or mental act. What explains its power, if anything? Certainly not the mere fact that it is, together with all prior acts, part of the temporal sequence of my life and of humanity. Humans experience occasionally ecstatic moments of happiness, but they also lapse back into their mundane lives, 
their dull moments could equally well be seen as undoing or cancelling out the affirmation delivered by the yes, by the yes ecstatic moments. For a dull moment tells me that life is dull, just as an ecstatic moment tells me that life is glorious. Of course, this is not how Nietzsche wants to see it. Those ecstatic moments reveal something essential about life, indeed transform life, redeem it. But how? The second passage that I will uh, quote to you, that's a poem, is taken from his Dionysian Dithyrambs, written in 1888 but published after he had um, become insane. In one poem called Glory and Eternity, Nietzsche repeats the pathos of eternity. However, more intriguing, I believe, is the poem, the tripartite poem, called The Sun is Setting, a poem about a stormy life coming to an end. Day of my life, <clears throat> the sun is setting. We are heading, we're headed towards evening. The hardship of the end of decrepitude is not denied here. Your eye already glows, <clears throat> half broken, already there springs up your dews tear trickle. But death nevertheless appears to announce its own serenity. Serenity, golden one, come, you, death's most intimate, sweetest foretaste. How so, we may wonder. What is there to taste and enjoy about death? For those who die, the process of dying is often cruel and painful. And for those who are dead, there is nothing to taste at all. The answer is, of course, that the only thing enjoyable is here the picture of death, as aesthetically transfigured in life by the poet and his charitable reader. Nietzsche concludes his poem in the following way. Seventh loneliness, never did I feel closer to sweet safety, warmer under the gaze of the sun. Does not the eyes of my peaks still glow? Silvery, light, a fish swims out my bark now. This is pure mythology, the consolation of the living with beautiful words. By such we are, suggest we are being suggested here a blissful imaginary focus, as I've mentioned already, beyond our reality, beyond our lives. Death is presented here as the culmination of a serene, safe stage of the soul. The final line, swims out my bark now, is particularly intriguing. It intimates that there is something out there something infinite and redeeming. But of course, in the atheistic framework, this is a lie. The boat will simply sail into the ocean with a decomposing corpse on board. Nietzsche doesn't tell us that. He avoids saying it. His poetic words conjure up a fiction pleasant to our ears, the living ones, those alive, but falsifying reality. Indeed, pleasant and rewarding because falsifying reality. In his deepest unwillingness to rest content with this world in all its brutality, lies Nietzsche's deepest similarity with Christianity as he portrays it. Thanks. <laughs>